Welcome to Health and Safety Conversations. Here's your host, Tom Bourne. Hi, and welcome to Health and Safety Conversations. I'm your host, Tom Bourne, and with me today is the wonderful Theo Venter. Theo, how are you? It's marvelous, Tom. How are you doing? Oh, not too bad, not too bad. Hey, Theo, I brought you on because I've done a little bit of research and I came across your story and I think it's a great story and I think more people should actually hear it. Uh, can you tell us a bit about yourself, what industry you, you sort of were in and uh, what you're currently doing now? Absolutely, Tom. Yeah, um, so I like to get on with stuff most most of the time and and get into it. So um, if if I go too fast or, you know, if I say too much, just stop me there and and, uh, and ask some questions. But happy to, to tell you I've been just a sparky for all my life, 17 years working as a sparky. And then one day I um, kind of got up onto a power pole. I was working on overhead power lines. And uh, on this specific day, it was a Monday morning, when I – when we were standing there trying to do the risk assessment, as we do every every morning, um, I ticked all the boxes and I wrote a few things at the bottom of that risk assessment that I could clearly remember was slip trips and falls, uh, drink a lot of water, um, right tool for the right job, and be aware or awareness. There's four of the best bull I, you, you could find on a thing. And flicked it into my car and said to my two teammates, come on, boys, this is a four-hour job, 40 degrees today, let's get up there and do this thing. You see, that morning, I was called into the office of the general manager, and he said to me, Theo, can you go and do this poll for us? Because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big job. And he said to me, hey, Theo, I'm asking you because you get the job done. Mm. And uh, I, yeah, I felt like, yeah, you know, I, I am the guy that gets the job done. So me and my best mate, Nico, j jumped on on this uh, insulated bucket. And what we did was we were, it's a specialized trade. We work on live electrical power lines with gloves and sleeves and, and insulated buckets. And, and it's a pretty a pretty great trade to do. It's very, it's very safe. It's a lot safer than working on dead lines, which um, it's funny enough. Um, in statistic wise, um, we got up there and we all kitted out. We had a safety observer downstairs and Nico was, was working for half an hour and he, and he kind of got frustrated and he said to me, Theo, I, I, I can't get this nut off. And, and you know, I, you, I said to him, mate, you must be tired. Let's grab a, get away from it. Give me a chance. Let, him, let me just see what I can do about it. And I stood in, in, his, in where his shoes was and I tried to get this nut off and I could not. Could not do it. Could not get it out. Oh. Now, there was a lot of things that rung through my head, but the first thing that went through my head in that second, that moment was, I'm the guy that gets a job done, and this little 12 mil nut's not going to make get me to done it. This will stop me from doing a four-hour job. Mm. You know, I, I thought for a second if I could get my gloves off, and I could put my hand in there because it was a steel cross arm. It was an angle iron. Couldn't see where it sits. It was a little an awkward spot. And, and I thought if I could just feel where this thing sits just for a second. And I had a quick glance behind me. Old Nico wasn't looking. He was talking to the safety observer. And I pulled my gloves off. And you know what? When I put my hands into between my knees and I started pulling the gloves out, that second, that moment, I never for a second even once considered how many times they told me not to do it when it's unsafe. You know how many times I sat in meetings when they said to me, hey, Theo, don't do it. If it's unsafe, don't do it. Mm. <laughs> that moment when I took my gloves off and, and they started releasing between my knees, I had this overwhelming gut feel, this extremely strong feeling that something's going to go wrong. And I hesitated for a second and I was standing there thinking, wow, that is a strong feeling. And 
with that feeling going, well, I don't know if I should do this. This is this doesn't feel right. There was this other voice said to me, hey, um, there's, th- it's so convenient. It's so easy. It's like, it's just, and all of this storm happens in a, in a matter of, of a second or two seconds. I just thought, wow, if I could just get my hands in there. And I override these, these voices, these screaming voices from my gut feel, override them and I stick my hands in there and I undo this nut, right? Yep. The nut falls down. I'm standing back thinking I am the, like, I know what I'm doing. I'm the man. You know how the ego starts to bloom and I, I'm, kind of, <laughs> I'm, kind of, I'm kind of basking in my own glory. Hmm. Unfortunately, that insulator just twisted and I didn't see the twist. And with my gloves not on to protect me, I had my right wrist on the right hand side on a steel cross arm and I had my left hand right in front of that insulator trying to stop that thing from from falling down. Yeah. And in that, it, it, you know, it's never that, that shortcut that you take it to get away with. It's what happens sometimes when you don't know, expect anything to come. That moment I took my hand and I just push it straight into that insulator to stop it from falling. Yep. And I had my, um, I stuck my hand into 22,000 volts. Mm. And um, to give you an idea, that 22,000 volts just absolutely ripped straight into me. I was just standing there like, ah just screamed and screamed and screamed for two and a half seconds, hooked on. You know, I, I knew exactly what was going on with me. I understood that I was, I was hooked on. I was burning up. Mm. But I couldn't do anything. I was a passenger. And at two and a half seconds in, my knees gave in and I lost consciousness. And I, you'll see my arm. If you see my arms there, yeah. you can see this arm has is, is, is got a bad exit wound. Where I dropped off on on the wrist, and that was the end of my life as I knew it. I was, you know, they took us down, and and I, I only woke up about half an hour later. Um, but what electricity does is it it actually it burns you from the inside out, so it'll boil your blood and it boils your your organs, your soft organs, everything that's got water. And it creates like a thousand degrees Celsius every half a second accumulates. So by the time I woke up, my insides, everything, my hands, everything was just burnt up. It was, it was the smoke was coming out of me. The guys on site had already called the ambulances and, and the bosses and all the people. And I just screamed, asking, begging for help. You know, um, they took me to hospital. And thing is, when when they got me into my burns room unit, the doctors looked at me knowing that, that I wouldn't make it. Mm. They, they didn't say much, but I think they said to my wife who was standing outside the room and so they said to him, you know, Theo, Theo's not gonna, he, there's no one that's ever made. They calculated 1,200 amps from arm to arm, it's, it's, it's phenomenal amps. And they said no one has ever survived it. She came in and she left my, my three little kids outside the room. And um, I can hear him, I could hear my little princess scream, begging for her daddy. Mm. And I begged them, I said, if they can bring my kids in, uh, you know, if I could just say goodbye to my kids for the last time, I just want to give them a hug. And, and they said to me, Theo, if you, you can't, your kids can't see you. You're not looking. I was I was all bloated and swollen up. And that day I decided not to say goodbye to my kids. I thought I'll die mm. without saying goodbye. I was in hospital for uh, five days when they did some tests and decided I'm or found out I'm I'm gonna not die. And then I went through a marathon of surgeries. I think I went through 17 surgeries in the first month and then just over a month and then uh, and then in hospital for a few months after that. I, I don't even know, four or five months it was. Um, came home, 
and fell into a severe depression and anxiety. Mm-hmm. And to a point where four or five months later, I was, I was suicidal. You see, I, I had no use of my hands. I, I, I didn't know how to, to handle life without anything. I couldn't stand up. I couldn't sit down. I, I had to depend on everyone to feed me and, and, and help me walk and help me live and wipe my bum. And it, it, it was just, it was unbearable. The day almost before I, I attempted my suicide, I uh, decided I'm going to take five of my brave, bravest seconds in my life and reach for help. I did. I ended up in a, in a physiotherapy program where it was amazing people helping me. And I must have gone through about 40-something surgeries, 47 surgeries in total. I'll skip forward. It was... It was about five years, uh, two years after my my incident that day on that fateful day of February 13th, when two years when my first finger moved. I was for two years with it was zero hands. It was, I had nothing, no hands. If if the listeners today just for a second, just think for it for a second, if you could bandage up your hands on a Saturday morning at six o'clock and only take, take those bandages off it on, on say Sunday morning. I'm, I'm asking for one day, mm. do it one day. See if you can see, see, see what it means to you. I, um, I can guarantee you, you, you won't cause you can't open a door. You can't drive. You can't eat. You can't do anything. My two years was, was very, very bad. Um, the, the, the stresses on, on my relationship, on my, on my wife became too much and that broke up as well. So I ended up having the three kids and starting to raise my three kids with nothing, with nothing I had. I was on workers' comp and, and they don't give a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Another three years later, I, uh, I was back at my workplace doing little bits and pieces when some some guy was sent my way and I believe today 100% sent my way and, and his name is Gary Cha. This guy came to me and said, Theo, can you tell your story to someone? And um, I said, I've got no confidence. I can't, I cannot talk to anyone about it. I, I, and at that stage, five years in, I've never for a single day reflected back on on what happened and how I got through all, all the years of hard work, dedication, failures, achievements. But he conned me that day, and, and it's a long story. I won't take your time on this thing, but he conned me in to, uh, and I was standing in front of, before I knew it, in front of 300 suits the one day, and he said, just come in and tell them your story. And, and I, I just... Yeah, I was so nervous, and and I'm sure if there's people that listen today and, and was sitting in that very first one, uh, it was the most moving presentation that I think anyone has ever seen because the whole crowd was crying with me as I um, went through the story. A few months later, I did it again, and then to answer your question is um, this is exactly what I do now. This has been 12 years. Um, and I've been speaking and uh, and saving lives for twelve years, or trying to save lives. Good, good, good. Oh my goodness, I can't tell you how much admiration I have for you because you're right. A lot of us would have just given up. I I, I can't even imagine what it's like to be literally. I'm I'm gathering you're pretty much burnt over most of your body, at least internally. So, good question. Um, they, I went through a lot of testing and a lot of places, and, and I had the most incredible surgeons. I mean, for those that knows Dr. Fiona Wood, she was my first surgeon. She went in and, and came in and, and said, Tia, we need to figure out why you, you didn't die mm. in the first place. Um, so, um, until today, they could not fathom why... I haven't been. So the only scars I have is from the elbows up uh, to my arms and from the elbow up to my arms. So with my arms spread, 
the, the left arm entrance wound and the right arm exit wound and severely damaged. But the internal organs, nothing, not a single scratch. Sorry, I just touched there. Not a single scratch on, on anywhere, any inside. They, they tested me. And yeah, I, I, today I, I, I look back and I think there was a, might, might have been a bit of a purpose. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because I, 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 I know it's a terrible thing to say this, but you should have bought a lottery ticket because the odds of surviving what you went through are incredible. Um, I've spoken to quite a few people who've lost close relatives um, through coming into contact with high voltage power lines and they describe their, their, their people as being literally burnt all over their body and deep veins of current passing through their body, body um, which is a horrible way, a horrible thing to happen. I've I've heard a surgeon describe it that if if the electricity gets you like that, you're either dead or you're devastated, and there's nothing in between. Yeah. Oh look, um, how many people over those years do you reckon you've had a chat to about this? Wow. Um. Uh. So. I think in total, I'm sitting at just about a quarter of a, just over a quarter of a million in seven countries. Um, and, I, and I must say, I must add that my first couple of years, I was, I was, and still today, I, I absolutely, you could not get me away from an audience. I, I just put me in front of an audience and, and let me go and talk to them. But after a couple of years, I don't know if this will make sense. It just felt like an empty, empty happiness because I knew I could do more instead of, and I know it sounds harsh, but instead of go and inspire and walk away and take my money and go and, and make a living out of it, I wanted, I wanted to give back more. I wanted to go and find out why. You know, Tom, my, my, my every single night, every single day, the question would not pass me as why did I do it? What was I thinking? How, how did I become so desensitized to, to my environment? If there's 22,000 volts around me, what mm. the hell made me take my gloves off? You know what? I, I, um, I think two years, three years in, I started studying and trying to figure out what's going on. And, and it, there was a, it's a big component of... Um, uh, behavioral science came out and I went into that path and then I ended up in, in a dead end. And then I went in another path and a dead end. And, and I, but all these, all these things came around to me about four, about five, six years ago when I, I actually wanted to find the bedrock foundation of why it is. What is it? I, I didn't want to talk about anything else, behavioral, anything else. I wanted to talk about um, like humanity, the, the, the start, where, do, where did we go? So I studied these things and I, and I found out that we have a, we, we, and, and this, is you, this is human biology. So just basic, basic biology, most of us will understand this and, and know what I'm talking about is We've got a, a system in, in our frontal brain. It's called the neocortex, frontal cortex, frontal lobe, whatever everyone knows about. And, ev and everyone knows what this thing does. And what I found was the, the neocortex, frontal cortex, is a place where you, you, you understand, you read language, you calculate, you analyze. You do all these things. It makes you, it makes, it gets you clever. And we all understand that. But it also calculates the path of least resistance. If you want to walk from here to a place, it'll calculate how to get there and it'll show you the shortest way, which in our workplaces, that comes down to shortcut. What is the easiest way to do it? Now, imagine, Tom, you, you, you get in a car in the morning or on a bus and you drive to work and you, and you get to work. The first thing you do is you go into safety meetings. Then you read your, your instructions. Then you read your, your JSAs and you take fives and you read all your 
uh, everyone's talking about these things, you make that brain stronger and stronger and stronger. By the time you actually go and do the work, you've done how many paperworks and, and, and this brain is overworked. Now you're going and, and you want to take a nut off. And at that second, that moment, that brain is the biggest thing in, in, that's been used today. That muscle is strong. And you now go, this is the easiest path of resistance. You know, when I had that gut feel mm -hmm. and, I, and it was over in it, tell me how many of you have had that gut feel? Be honest with yourself. You've get, you, you, you're just about to do something really, really stupid. And you know it's <laughs> yeah. not going to end well. Yeah. And you still go ahead and do it. Yeah. Why do we? Why do we? Is it is is it the fact that we're complacent? Is it the fact that we uh as you said, we overload the brain with mm. stuff which isn't going to protect us? Yep. And and some we don't leave room for the important decision making decisions. There, there's, there's, there was one thing I when you started telling your story and you're talking about filling out a, I think it was a JSA before you started work. And you're talking about the right tools for their job and, and slips, trips, and falls, and that. I didn't hear you mention electricity. We, electricity was every day around us. You see yeah. exactly right. Where is that? Where is that? That's that's the actual. That's the material risk is going to kill us. Yeah. So coming coming down to this is, I have taken this new cortex brain so far in teaching it and helping it and calculating and analyzing and reading and writing and understanding language to the point when I took my shortcut right there and then, there was something just before what happened was that, that, that gut feel. And I clearly understand and, and remember when that gut feel was so overwhelming, I was almost hoping someone would stop me because it didn't feel right. I was almost in for a millisecond is scared that this thing is real. Then I went, where does it come from? What is it? Where does it come from? Where does it gut feel come from? And, and, and there's, a, there's a lot of written, stuff written on it. But there's a little brain at the back here. It's called the limbic system, limbic brain. It's, it's, it, it, it deals in, in um, curiosity and, and, and it deals in... Um, emotions and um, all kinds of those things that that's not calculatable it's it's where it comes from and and right inside of that brain is where safety sits that's where you go and pick safety out of it so i don't want to disappoint anyone but you don't have a gut feel there's nothing in there in the gut that's that that that's there this little brain when you are uncomfortable or you're just about to do something stupid or it knows from experience and past experience it sends the signal to your gut saying hey don't do it, it says this is not going to end well that signal goes to your gut for a reason because the gut is such a powerful place it's the heart have you ever heard of someone saying um you've got to make a decision with your head or your your, your heart mm -hmm. what's the feeling that's the two brains having a fight a tussle in your mind you know, um, I want to give you another example, Tom. The, I was, I was, it was such a pure example for me. I was at, at a friend's house and he had three kids um, and he was constant, consistently picking stuff up where they're going to get hurt and closing gates. And, and then it was the pool gate. And then, you know, he put chairs in front of places where they're going to get hurt and, and consistently being there for them. And I was with him the next day and he literally tripped almost over stuff that was in his path but he never even thought about picking it up or or, or fixing the things on site that that like he did yesterday mm -hmm. and i had a chat with him in the crib rooms and i said to him what do you think that is and he just went wow i i i never even thought about it it's what we call the emotional connection Mm -hmm. And and now we're talking emotional limbic brain. That's the thing that that tells you, please don't do it. Believe it. They also call it um, uh, chronic unease, or or there's a lot of words for for these things. But that is the key. It's the um, is the superpower of the brain. But it's it's it, it lies dormant because there's not a lot of people that understands how to help people to understand the, the power of emotion.
Yeah. And um, and that is what I found out over the years. And now, um, because my presentation is such an overwhelming, powerful presentation, and it's so um, emotional at times, that when I'm finished, my audience is 100% invested in that emotional brain. Yeah. And that is where the goal comes from. That is where, when you get your audiences there, um, you can give them the tools and say, this is what you trust. And then it works. I, I want to give you a last example. My last presentation I did uh, in a, um, for, for minors, and um, it was halfway through my presentation, and the, and the biggest guy you've ever seen jumped up halfway through, and I thought, oh, I've said something wrong. And he was rushing towards me and he gave me the biggest bear hug, man hug I've ever had in my life, big boy. And um, his 100 people, 100 friends that were sitting there with him was so relieved that, he, that someone has got the, you know, that, that emotional connection, that, that power to come and comfort me in, in, the, in the time where I really needed it. And then when everyone was clapping hands for him, he turned around and he said to them, no, you don't understand. I didn't give him a hug. I needed a hug. So <laughs> he turned it around and said he just couldn't take it anymore. And, and that is the power of the, the connection, isn't it? If you can have that invested and align those 100 people, align their values into something with that power of, of emotion, um, that is the bedrock foundation of where safety sits. And, and I've seen it many times. It works. So I don't know if all that makes sense. No, it certainly does. certainly does. Um, look, a couple of questions that just come to mind. Um, first of all, were you always the worker that got stuff done? Were you, did you have that reputation in, in the company? 100%. Yeah, good question. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 was the, I was the guy that they could give the job to, I would get it done. Um, yeah. 100%. Do, you, do you think do you think that contributed at all to, to the incident? The fact that Absolutely. you had a reputation, yeah, yeah, you felt the, the I'm I'm guessing you felt the pressure to actually live up to it because you want that's what you believe. Get in, get stuff done, go home, basically. Um, and no messing around. I can still see that's that's part of your life now when you want to get into the story in it. But do you think that actually contributed to the incident? 100%. There, there, there's a lot of, look, if if we're going to go and look for for um, causes, um, I there, there's a few things that I could own, and I have actually owned it. In, I own it in front of all my audiences. I go, that was me. I'm, I, I'm this extreme ownership. I do. And that contributed a lot. Um, the fact that we were here on on visas, you know, mm -hmm. if we did stuff up, then it, it, they would frown upon us. That was a that was a big deal as well. Um, we had a certain amount of work to be done. You know, works pressure was done. That was that was there. Um, there was all these all these factors that came along in doing it. But when I when the, the work safe and my managing director walked into my hospital room the day and they said to me, hey, Theo, we're now investigating what's what's going to happen. You know, the, the, the only thing I wanted to do, Tom, was I wanted to blame them, make excuses and deny everything. But I was taught that, and my dad always said to me that, if you can speak the truth in your vulnerability, you are within your power. Mm -hmm. And I stopped them immediately. And I said to him, I am most probably the most vulnerable person on earth because I just, I, I just heard I was going to survive this. But I said to them, I want to own it. I really want to own it. And I said, look, I, I took my gloves off and I made the conscious choice to do it, to do so, regardless of every other factor around us. Um, of how pressure, how much pressure I felt and perceived pressure. And I don't know, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on, but I did it. Yep. And I own it. Yep. And um, that, that worked out very well for me. I felt good. Yeah. I'm just going to ask one more question about it. Was this the first time 
that you, you'd taken your glove off in a sort of a, like a similar situation? You nailing the questions, Tom. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll explain this to you in, in, in this way. The week before my accident, mm-hmm. I, my incident was on Monday morning. The week before, on a Wednesday morning, I was working on a, on, on a similar built-up switch. Um, there was a couple of guys working up there, and they were doing lifeline work, and we were working at the bottom. There was about eight of us working at the bottom mm-hmm. of the pole. About eight, nine o'clock in the morning, I was standing back to see how far they're going, and I looked up, and there was one of the guys that did not have his gloves on, and they were working. And I screamed, blew the whistle, and said, everyone stand back. Whoa, stop right now. I said, hey, mate, you, you forgot your gloves. Mm-hmm. The guy turned around, looked at me, and he said to me, hey, Theo, two things. Never tell anyone what you just saw. And never try it yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He took his gloves off because he wanted to do some stuff. Yep. To answer your question, I've never, ever seen it. That was the cardinal sin. I was, I'd never, ever seen anyone do it, and I would in my life not do it myself. Thing is, two days later, I was sitting in a safety meeting, and everyone on site knew what was going down on that day. The managing director walked into us and he cl- slams the door closed and he says, everyone sitting here, when there was a lot of us, he says, everyone sitting here, we are now, this is a safe place. You can now talk and say anything out there. Feel free. This is a safe place. What's going on out there? We need to find out so we can help you. Mm-hmm. And the more he said these things, the more there was eight, 10 people staring straight in my back and going, I wonder if he was going to do it. You know what I did? Yeah. No, I, I got hands off to the managing director because that's some real forward thinking it, to, to actually do that. I've actually seen that happen a few times. And believe it or not, once was about 10 years ago uh, where a manager's actually shut the door and said, now tell me the truth. Yeah. Um, and, you know what I did? I didn't say a word. Oh, no. Yeah. Was it was it because you didn't want to get the person in trouble or was it because you didn't believe it was a safe space? Um, I didn't have the guts to do it. That's okay. You know how many, how many times they said, say to you, look after your mates? Mm. I was looking after my mates. Yeah. I knew the consequences of, of that. I, I didn't, maybe I didn't think it was a safe space. But the thing is, when I walked out of there, I walked out of that meeting with my head hanging low and everyone was looking at me in a way that, oh, yeah, good, he didn't do it. But man, and it was two, that was Friday morning. It was two days, Tom, two days later when I was finding myself in a bolt of switch and I thought, wow, that guy took his gloves off. Yeah. Mm. Oh dear! All right. Um, do you th- ever do those "what if" moments that sometimes we all seem to have in our lives, where you go, "What would my life be now if I hadn't have taken the gloves off?" Oh, that, that one went through my head a million and a million more times. It it. The severe pain I caused my family, the breakup of my of my marriage, the my my mates that was with me in in those baskets um, on site, the, the the ripple effect on them was severe. The, the burden they they were bearing, the, um, the 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 in insane pain I'm still living with today. Um, it it's extremely overwhelming you know a guy asked me one day he said to me if you know if you know what you knew what you know now would you have done it and i said to him honestly i said if you ask me five years or ten years ago i would have pulled everything back if i had the chance Mm -hmm. and and go back and not cause the, the traumatic pain for everyone i did if he, what if, if I knew it today, um, I've inspired hundreds of thousands of people. I, 
Mm. I don't think I can take it back anymore. Yeah. I could yeah. not do it. So um, I think I, uh, I'm doing very well. I think my purpose is, is to stand in front of audiences and show vulnerability and weakness and, and show strength in that and, um, and, and inspire them to, yeah, to, to be the person that would stand back and, and believe in that gut feel, make sure that you, you and your mates go home. That's, that's what it's about. Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of people, a lot of people, when they hear about serious incidents and such, uh, when they find out that no one was killed, that you know, they'll they would say, "Well, that's a tragedy that it happened." But thank goodness, he'll be right. He, everything's fine. They come out of a hospital a couple of weeks later, and in the meantime, they've forgotten all about it. Um, for those who uh, think that everything's going to be all right, can you tell them a bit more about how hard it was to get some sort of normalcy back into your life? Yeah, I skipped that part for <laughs> for a for a reason because it 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 is extremely. Um, you know, your friends calls you maybe the first couple of weeks or so um, in hospital. They come and visit maybe once or twice. It, it goes away after two months or three months. Um, when you're sitting in, in that dark place in your home, night after night after night on your own after everyone has left you, um, and, and you get the worst dreams in the world that you're being hooked onto a power line, mm. and you wake up crying. And um, and then you you're trying to stop the electricity from coming through you, and you look at your arms, and you, you're not dreaming. It, it 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 is the worst nightmare, and that was day after day after day, um, which when you when you've got little kids to 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 grow up, you got to swallow all the hardship and all all those things, and and try and my little five year old little princess. Um, she was the one that comforted me sometimes. She'd be, she had to become the, you know, the, the grown-up woman in the house. Mm. And she helped to, to make food for the kids. And sometimes I had, ah, this is tough, because um, I had two or three weed pigs in the house. And I had to put water over the weed pigs to, uh, to, to get my kids to school because I couldn't afford I could not afford the milk sometimes. I couldn't afford the shoes for them. Teachers would call me up and say, hey, Theo, would you, um, do you mind if we give you, you know, your, your boys or someone a, a couple of sandwiches? Um, your workers' comp doesn't, doesn't pay much, mm. you know, and, and it's a big part of, of getting better. Um, they, they worked so much on my hands to get my hands back working. I, I almost think it was over a million, maybe $1.5 million. Mm. But at the end of the day, they, I don't, I didn't have the money to look after the kids and, and, and stuff like that. So yeah, every day was a slog. Every day was tough, but uh, the day I went for my driver's license, I failed it because I couldn't put my safety belt on. <laughs> uh, yeah. I did it three, four times and then passed it after that. Um, and and slowly, you know, the the one day I was sitting on the side of my bed and I and I didn't have the the guts to get up and walk towards my toothbrush. Mm. I I just I just gave up. I couldn't do it. Just gave up. Mm. And I counted that five seconds, that five brave seconds down, which which helped me getting through my my suicide attempt. And uh, I count those five seconds down the second time. And I got up and I took a little shuffle towards my toothbrush. But I dug so deep. I was so brave in that moment that that little shuffle I took that day was so significant. It was such a beautiful moment. And I read the other day, it said that the smallest little step in the right direction can become the biggest leap of your life. And that little step I took that day meant that I've I've got enough confidence today to 
to to stand here and talk to people and and I've got enough confidence to to tell them you know all my weaknesses and and what's theirs and and how to get through it and you know basically it it's not worth it it's not worth it to get the job done don't yeah. take them and take those shortcuts no that's great to hear. and I really do appreciate you actually uh, opening up because it's those things that people don't see and it's those things that people don't know. Um, yeah. All right. Um, changing tack a little bit because I don't want to cry myself. Um, uh, you said you're on a visa. Was that uh, – did I pick up a uh, Rhodesian slash uh, Zimbabwean accent? That's very close, 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 close. I, I, I must say I do come from the Rugby World Cup Union Champions of the World, which, of course, is the Springboks in South Africa. I thought you so, were going to uh, say Ireland coming up. So. <laughs> no, they're not there. <laughs> uh, I'm looking forward to that. It was going to be a big one anyway. Oh, but, yep. yeah, from South Africa, so born and raised, born and raised over there. Yeah, no, no, that's good. Um, all right, you've written a couple of books. Can you tell us a little bit about them? Yes, absolutely. Um, so the first book is Conven oh, Convenience Kills, uh, Real Safety. Um, real Safety, I'm, I met, it's, it's sometimes a little, uh, so sometimes things happen to you which you can't understand, and in a few years or so later, you look back at it and you go, yes, no, I now understand, understand what it is. Um, I'm, I met a guy called Ken Roberts. Mm-hmm. Um, at one of my presentations, and he and he said to me, "We have to get together and talk." And I said, "Well, mate, I'm actually working in a small little town called uh, Olympic Dam. Yes. Uh, it's just uh, out there." And he says, "Well, I live there, <laughs> so could not believe both of us flying back to the same place." And they started talking about, and 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 it just absolutely exploded. It's a, he's a brilliant man. He's he's been involved with personal development um, for many many years he's been involved in mining for many years so we my views and 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 his views and and our boundaries and everything values everything just absolutely lined up and he said do you want to do a book and i said mate absolutely let's do it so we started doing um the 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 real safety book get real and uh and and it, it it was just Everything that we believed in is, is put in, in that book. And, and it kind of shows, it's a, it's a tough book to read. It's not an easy read. Um, you got to actually have pen and, and, and pencils and scratch down. There's so many golden nuggets in there that you can, you can read and, and gather around. But it basically gives us the, the full perspective of, of how we can actually change the world in, in, in safety by emotional connection. And, and where safety actually sits. The convenience kills is it sits on in, on page, I think, 77, if I don't have it wrong. And that's one of the chapters that everyone came back reading the book saying, this is absolutely brilliantly mind-blowing. It is the convenient option. If you forever, and everyone that's listening here, forever change the world with the words from... Um, uh, not convenience, complacent. Mm. If you ever say complacent again, change the complacent with convenient mm. and see how your sentence has a different energy. Because when you say I've, I've been complacent, it's complacent's fault. When you say I've been convenient, it's my fault. Mm. It changes. It changes your ownership. And, um, and most of the accidents I know has been uh, incidents has been con- because of convenience that's all yeah good yeah um, and if we wanted to get a copy of either of these books uh where would we or how would we go about getting them absolutely my my old website is still happening at uh, mm-hmm. i should be on top don't go to any of the other there's a lot of people that uses my name but uh, go to my official website you will see my website is in there that's exactly where you can go and and book a talk and mm-hmm. And book a couple of books. I think they like twenty bucks each or something. I'm not not sure how much they are. Um, and uh, that is, I use these books mostly as my uh, business card. I that's what I believe in. That's my highest values in those books. And 
if you read that before I come over and have a talk, we, you know, everyone will understand 100% what, where I am and what I'm talking about and my values. Good, good. And uh, for those who are inspired to get you over either to listen to you themselves or to uh, come and have a chat to their their people, will you, even though you're in obviously the best state in Australia, would you, uh, would you venture out from Western Australia? No, they can come over to me and we'll catch them. <laughs> <laughs> we'll catch them on the beach. Maybe me and you can go fishing and then oh, we'll, sounds good. We can just go and <laughs> and set up a little a little spot down at the beach. Yeah, absolutely. I my my business address is in is in Sydney. Yep. Um, I I do I go there almost every week. So um, on next week I'll be in Brisbane and then in Sydney after that. So I do venture out there, but a lot of um overseas stuff as well so there's there's a lot of interest overseas which um, i'm trying not to do too many of because the presentation is very taxing it's very hard it's very emotional Mm. and i do give a hundred percent every time and in the beginning i did too many and i and i went into a bit of a into a bit of a depression and slump and but now 100 percent back uh, and I and I manage myself, and I'm yeah. happy about it. You know, I manage my own happiness and my own mental health now. So yeah, everywhere Excellent. is good. Excellent. Uh, on a personal front, Theo, I, I I hope your kids are awful proud of you because you know they should be, mate. They should be picking yourself up, uh, putting yourself back together again, raising them, and uh, getting an education at the same time. It, it's a phenomenal effort. So congratulations, mate. Or seriously, um, you're a better man than I could be. So having said Thank that, uh, times are just about at an end. So Theo, um, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. Um, really genuine. I, I do appreciate you coming on and, and, and giving us your time and sharing some of those, um, some, some of your story because it, it really is a good story, mate. So, but for now, we're going to have to say goodbye. But I do look forward to speaking to you again soon. Absolute pleasure. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for listening to Health and Safety Conversations with Tom Bourne. Until next time, stay safe and enjoy the rest of your week.